following video, we're going to take a look at a game that I played on Lee Chess and Blitz against someone roughly 2,700. And it's an interesting line that I've been facing far more often. And tell me in the comments if you can tell me where it comes from, because I honestly have no idea. But the popularity has been surging lately as I'm playing Alakine games. And my answer is going to come from the first Alakine book on Chessable and arguably still the best, Alakai Defense, The Dark Knight Rises, and that Olympiad Spotlight Sale is still going on, so if you have interest, this is one of those times to get it at a pretty serious discount. So without further ado, let's jump right in to the game. So, what is interesting about this opening? Well, I play d5, which I feel is by far the most combative response, and still to this day with Stockfish 17, engine first choice move. And after knight f3, typically I'm seeing bishop c4 very often here, where I give two options in my Alakine course. The more aggressive option that Bortnik typically follows is knight b6, Personally, I like to go with a more solid approach with c6 followed by e6 with a very simple plan of knight d7, queen f6, and as the queen moves, we follow for the queen trade and hit the c-pawn. So not too much to remember there, and typically they trade queens. You get an in-game position out of the gate, and for me, that's typically what I'm aiming for these days as I'm not studying nearly as much, so I'll rely on intuition and shuffling for the win, much like my great predecessors. So after knight f3, we already have the question of what's the most optimal way to develop. And when researching this position, I found that a Grunfeld style setup gives black the best chances. So g6, as opposed to, say, bishop f5 or bishop g4. And after bishop c4, we don't lose time like we would with move four, bishop c4. We can go ahead and capture here. And this is where you get that kind of aforementioned Grunfeld-esque setup. So after bishop g7, we both castle. And normally by now, white has played d4. And we go for that thematic Grunfeld-style break. But here, my opponent plays rook e1, and if they're neglecting to play what's typical in the position, you should be focused on reacting to the idea that they should be playing. Which is why, when studying openings in general, you don't need to just understand your perspective. If you understand the basic themes or plans in the position for your opponent, if they're neglecting on a move, if they're wasting time with moves like h3, a3, bishop b2, maybe you have that Karpovian idea to take away what the opponent's doing in the position. So here, c5 is relatively natural playing against that central expansion. And if I can keep them stuck with double pawns, that's going to be an advantage moving forward. Now, a move that I've seen very often in bullet games from this style position is bishop a3. So quick and easy, what is the most aggressive response for black here to deal with bishop a3? Well, we have a threat on our pawn, and it's not. If you had that, oh, I need to play b6 immediately to defend it, eh. look for the most aggressive response. Queen a5 not only defends, it aggressively defends and puts pressure on that a3 bishop. So be looking for these types of moves. And it's something I've been working with for myself as well as my students is constantly asking them in middle game positions to use that thought process of what is the most aggressive move. As too often we miss opportunities because we've turned off our tactical radar. Well, my opponent plays h3 here and this is another one of those indicators. Well, he didn't want to play d4 too quickly because he was worried about bishop g4 and something's gone wrong for white in the opening if you're starting to have to make defensive concessions like the move h3. So he wants to play d4. I continue with natural development and keep an eye on the square. 
And here I wanted to show what happens if we follow the main line. Because White got a bit creative thinking that the main line doesn't work. So let's go D4. If they follow along with what should be done, I'm going to give you a test position here to see how you react. So we have a plus, but in my opinion, this is a very difficult position because you've got to find the best path forward for black. How much is a pawn worth? So if you're a pause your video type of person, this is a good test position to try to figure out what's the best path forward in this middle game. All right, so gave you time to pause if you're interested in trying to figure it out yourself. And I feel that the optimal way to continue, you've got to get out of the bind of being stuck with your pieces in mostly defensive positions. So the give back is the best way to go here with bishop e6 after takes takes. There are multiple ways that white could go, but we're going to be getting counterplay immediately here. And that attack on f2 is the main theme. And if you found bishop e6 with this idea, I'm quite impressed. Let me know in the comments if you found that. So bishop e3, and if you just trade, both of the white rooks are going to have targets. So in between move, bishop c3, let's cover the b6 pawn. And we've been able to slowly uncoil. Now we can go on the offensive, likely looking to put some pressure on the c pawn. So I, I liked when doing analysis on this game and finding that kind of test position because I looked at that position as, as quite difficult and I know in a blitz game I wouldn't have been able to find bishop e6 because it's, it's counterintuitive to double your pawns in an end game <laughs> where that's typically a feature that you look to avoid for activity. So more of a middle game concept. Anyways. Knight g5 was played in the main game here, and f7 is a little bit pressured. So I said to myself, what's really the idea? Okay, we're bothering f7. So I'm going to stop this plan in the most active way that I see, knight e5. Even better was knight a5, followed by b6 with natural development. Because he doesn't want to drop back to b3, as we're going to capture. And I can't say why I chose to play knight e5 versus knight a5. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so knight e5, central is, I mean, putting the knight in the center. Centralization, think about it. Bishop f1, and then h6. This, what is your only active piece, go away. You're attacking a pawn, straightforward. Let's defend and get ready to get our bishop out to a good square. And a missed opportunity for white. Maybe you should try d4. And we've got this solid, again, kind of Grunfeld style position. And I, I see this type of pawn structure in the Tarash and the Alapin and just in general openings that I get bored playing against because it's the same thing. If white doesn't win in the middle game, these pawns are really weak in pretty much every end game, and play is very natural against it. d3 was played, which is a bit too solid. Bishop b7. And now we get a position which looks very much like an English opening. And since this is something that I play quite a lot with white, I feel right at home here as if I have turned the table somehow. White's got a bit of a passive position. I don't see how he's pressing at all here. I've connected the rooks and in the meantime defended my bishop against potential sacrifice discoveries to try to get my b7 bishop. Well, queen f3. So now we need to start asking every move here. I've optimized. I've gotten my pieces developed. 
this should be the point where we can attack if we have the superior position. So what is the most aggressive enforcing move? Hopefully you find e5, getting time on the bishop, taking some space in the center, really adding more control to d4 to keep these pawns doubled so that if we make it to an end game, every end game is going to be favorable. So good move, bishop h2. Again, I ask, what is the most forcing and aggressive move? f5. Let's gain some space, and this may make some people hesitate. She's like, oh, your, your king's got a lot of air around it. Yeah, but how are you going to prove it? How is this bishop going to coordinate? How is this knight going to coordinate? Oh, if I could arrows, to take <laughs> advantage of light squares. He's not. So is it a weakness? No. You have to prove it's a weakness. So in this case, after f5, knight d2, and... We could look at potential discoveries with moving the knight, but say to myself, hey, I am just going to fully secure the position and keep my space. Because too often people look for the knockout blow too quickly, and then you start going on adventures and spoil the advantage. I just want to fully optimize the position. So queen d1, undevelopment by white. Say, okay, well, rook a d8, I activate my only piece not in the game. And this is keeping white honest and making sure that there's no breaks. And even I have the potential to press a little bit here. Knight c4. Say, okay, I'm still looking at the idea of pressing in the center. After a4, I wouldn't mind taking. Again, what is the most forcing aggressive move? f4. I get the plan that I wanted, and this pawn structure is not exactly something to be desired. So how can we get the most out of the position? Should we be trading? Should we be attacking? What's the call here? Is the transition to the end game going to be better than keeping queens on the board? Well, in this case, I felt that keeping the queens on the board, getting a tempo, and trying to press the attack is the best way to go. So queen e2, free space, why not? Rook e d1, and by this point I was already getting in, in time trouble, and I wish I had more time in this position to really consider the attacking ideas. Because here I went for a plan that it got away from me some. And I definitely could have lost the game. But my mentality lately when I'm low on the clock is, again, that mentality I'm working with my students on is look for the most forcing aggressive move. Because in mutual time trouble, being attacked is uncomfortable. So shuffling is always much easier than having to play accurate defense. So. What would you do here? See if you can improve on my play in the game. All right, so if you just wanted the free pawn, I commend you. In my mind, I said to myself, oh, that guy's not going anywhere. I, I, I can get him anytime. Let's, let's press the attack somewhere else. But the thing is, you get that d4 square for the pieces. And after knight d4, this is already a liquidation style position where we can just force simplification and it's going to be a very easy position for black to convert. Now me, I decided to go for it. It's like, all right, F3. Now let's back up and say, hmm, are these bishops good? No. So bishops are good in open positions. Yes. Do you have the bishop here? No. Should you keep your opponent's pieces bad? Yes. Does opening up the king side guarantee some sort of attack? No. <laughs> so there's really no reason to press the attack here the way that I did because it just encourages my opponent. F3. So queen e3. And here is another... The F3 I don't think in and of itself was a terrible move. This next move was though because... I still have white in a bind. I mean, look at the light square bishop on f1. Just can't do anything. It's a pawn with a funny hat. 
So what I should do is rook takes and say, all right, you've got the bishop pair. I'm gonna make sure you don't have the bishop pair. The position is still closed. Your bishop on f1 is still bad. I'm just transitioning into a good knight versus bad bishop ending. Takes, takes. Queen g5, would you like to trade? No. Okay, I've got this nice pin. And black has definitely the better of it here with pressure on the king side. And look at all these weird looking pawns on the queen side still. I'll turn though after queen e3, say, hey, let me be a friend to you, sir. I'm gonna go ahead and help you with your worst piece. Again, time trouble, we do these things. So, at this point, I need to maintain that e pawn. So let's go ahead and trade there to keep my rook on the e file. And at least I spotted the idea that the engine pointed out that we have a non pair, and a pair of pieces is typically going to be a non pair of minor pieces. I know the bishop pair is good, so I say, let's get rid of that. It was rook d5. All right, let's get that off the board. And now queen e6. Flexible coverage. Got everybody on the e file here. My knight's covered. Queen f4. So first thing I notice is we gotta watch out for potential tactics with rook d6, but is it something to worry about? Not so much. Rook e7, I'm putting my rook on a dark square and keeping watch on the base pawn. So sometimes the best course of action is to just wait in the position because how can white build up any pressure and again, this is now pinnacle time pressure, I would say less than 30 seconds for both players with no delay or increment. So rook d6, and I did see that I had queen e5 as a resource. And yes, I'm giving this pawn, but why did I give this pawn in this situation? Because of knight takes c4. And you go, well, aren't you losing this one? Yeah. But where's that rook going? Every now and then, I will be able to find some decent moves in this game that we enjoy. It's after rook c6. A nice flourish. And my opponent played on from here, but honestly, it's just a matter of technique. And I go on to, to win on time relatively shortly. So hopefully you enjoyed this game. I mean, the Alakine defense is pretty much my, my uh, favorite opening still against 1e4, even though I've had books and resources on other things. It's, to me, anytime a sideline is played against the Alakine, you're guaranteed not only equality, but fighting equality that you can press for a win where there's pieces on the board. In general, the Alakine defense it is a bit risky when we're considering modern theory, but what's your threshold for risk and surprise value? It's definitely something to ask, and you might be interested in checking it out and testing the opening. So if you are, you can also check out Alakine Defense on the channel, just Palm Beach Chess and Alakine Defense, and you'll see kind of overviews of I've given on my book, and Short and Sweet on Chessable is a, a free course giving kind of an overview of what to expect from the main course. Oh, check it out if you're interested.